Well, hello everybody. Uh, hopefully you're here to hear Anthony Larson talk. If not, stay anyways. Um, <laughs> you'll be very enlightened listening to him. And today he's going to talk about... Um, it actually just slipped my mind. Uh, about polar configuration, energy, and our human bodies. But he had a better word for it. it just slipped about, my mind. about immortality. Uh, the human body in the electric universe. Yeah, that's what it was. But before we start, I wanted to show a couple of things. I actually <laughs> forgot. Um, so a little while ago, I went to Paris to see my in-laws for Christmas. That made my wife really happy. <laughs> what woman doesn't want to go there? But, you know, a very famous um, building that's there is the Eiffel Tower. Right now, I was not that excited like my wife to see it, but when going down there and seeing some of the other symbols that are around it, I got a lot more excited. In fact, she wanted to get a poster, and so I helped pick one. And maybe you guys can see something on this. Um, so there's like the A, right? And then I wish this picture was better at this, but there's also a little a little ball at the top. And then, um, I think these colors should have been different. I, I, if I would have done this, I would have had the woman be blue and the car red. And, you know, with um, Saturn. And then Venus, the female aspect, was blue. And then Mars, um, the savior aspect, was red which is, you know, masculine, and the car is more masculine. So when I saw this and some of the other things around, I'm like, I like the Eiffel Tower now. <laughs> Where before, I just thought it was one big piece of metal. That's oh. Yeah. So there, see, the Venus is blue, and it's got the, this, this picture has the eight streamers from it, and then the Mars is, is red. Um, but here, they do have the colors, and when you see it, you can see the alpha and omega. Um, where's the little marker? I'll just, for those, so you can see it. So the, there's the circle at the top, and then the A on the way up, and it has the colors in it. Um, another one I just came across recently. Anybody have a dollar? I'm just kidding. I probably just. Um, I think no, I got one. But if you look at this right here, just this part, that looks like the unfinished pyramid, right? And if you go look at the spirals on the Salt Lake Temple, before it has the circle, it has the unfinished pyramid at it. The angles are more steep than most pyramids, but if it's the same basic shape. And if you look at the dollar bill on the on the pyramid, it's the unfinished pyramid, and then what stands out the most is the triangle above it. But if you look at the illumination that's coming out from the triangle, it's another circle. It's another alpha and omega right there on your dollar bill. And I find that kind of fascinating that I, I kind of had an aha a little while ago where it, it's there. Um, but. This triangle of the top has to do with illumination that's on the, the dollar bill. And what is the symbol of Alpha Omega? It's Christ. And that's where all illumination comes from. He inspires us to be better people, to be like him, and to have not just eternal life, but to live with him once again in our, our Heavenly Father. So I'd like to um, bring Anthony up to talk about this wonderful subject. But before we do, let's give him a big hand. A little hand would do. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate you coming. I hope I can keep the uh, whiteboard in place without it collapsing. She put it together, the librarian put it together with duct tape earlier, so we'll see if it stays in place. Um, one of the things that I've seen as I try to teach Latter-day Saints some of the things that I've discovered in my research 
is um, uh, a dearth of understanding what, it, what Joseph Smith was trying to teach. We have a church today and it teaches us the basic gospel principles and all that is well and good. But we fail, I think, to comprehend all of the information that Joseph Smith made available to us. And we're going to talk about that today. Um, Joseph Smith has been the... Uh, Touchstone, the, the, my guide in all of my research. I was just explaining to Diane here before that when I came across Velikovsky's research, it quickly became clear to me the only way I could validate what he had to say because it was different than anything else I'd ever read regarding the Exodus in ancient history. The only way to validate it would be to find something said by a Latter-day prophet perhaps Joseph Smith being the first, that would corroborate what Velikovsky had said about the Exodus. In other words, I keep going back to Joseph Smith. It's like that, um, is it Jules Verne story, Journey to the Center of the Earth? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these intrepid explorers go down into a volcano based on a map left behind by a, um, uh, an explorer uh, by the name of Arne Sachnason. And uh, as they descend into the bowels of the earth, they encounter many different adventures, but they, whenever they got lost, they could orient themselves, or often did, because Arne Sockmason had left his initials carved in various places along the path so they could verify that they were taking the same path as Arne Sockmason. Well, in my adventure into uh, unknown, uncharted regions of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the restoration, I had the same experience. I would I would go down a, a corridor with a concept and I'd get to a point where I would wonder, is it, could this possibly have anything to do with the gospel? And I'd go back and do some study and lo and behold, I would find the initials J.S., Joseph Smith, carved on this metaphorical wall that I'm talking about. So my adventure parallels the story of uh, journey to the center of the earth. And Joseph Smith was my guide and still is my guide. And tonight I'm gonna to talk specifically about some of the things that he communicated to us as Latter-day Saints that we tend to overlook. We see it as incidental to the gospel, uh, not having any uh, direct relationship to the gospel. And yet uh, when we consider it in the light of other discoveries, other things that have been uh, made available in recent years, we begin to see Joseph Smith in an entirely new light. And you'll see what I'm talking about as I get through this lesson. Now, don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm going to have to jump from modern revelation scriptures to things like uh, electrical energy and how it operates in our solar system and how the human body responds to that. And so I'm going to be making some leaps of logic here. If I make too large a leap, uh, please raise your hand and say, that doesn't make sense. What would you like to add to that? Or what would you like to, would you like to explain this or that? So um, we'll talk about this. Um, now let's see. The first thing we need to talk about is electricity. Electricity is a relatively new discovery for the human race. 
thanks to people like Tesla and several others, uh, uh, we now have an electrical system that uh, illuminates the night. We live as our ancestors could never imagine. And it's primarily due to electricity. There are some other inventions, but electricity is the thing that drives our economy, it drives our culture, it shapes our lifestyle. Um, uh, we uh, stay up into the night where our ancestors had to go to bed. Um, it it uh, washes our clothes, it cooks our food. Um, uh, microwave ovens are essentially electrical. I mean, they plug into an outlet, so they generate microwaves using electricity something that astronomers haven't quite discovered yet. Uh, they believe that microwaves in space are generated by explosive events. They will not acknowledge that the electrical nature, they give it passing, uh, a passing nod, but they refuse to see how much our universe is governed by electricity. But there are many kinds of electricity, and I want to demonstrate this. Is there someone who can the lights? Yeah. We can see these. Anyone recognize this? Has anyone ever seen one of these before? These, this is actually called, go ahead. This is actually called a plasma ball. And what we're seeing here are, are electrical charges being drawn from the surface in towards the ball. Our perception is going the other way, but it's not. And these little filaments, these little blue filaments that we see are called, uh, well, they're plasmas. They're called Birkeland currents after uh, uh, Swede who discovered them years ago, Christian uh, Birkeland. And uh, we see this sort of activity. For us, this is a novelty. It has no real function except as a curiosity, but as a matter of fact, in space, this is the way things work. And the reason is because of the nature of matter. And you'll see how this applies to Joseph Smith in a minute. Like I said, I'm gonna be moving through a lot of things. Matter is composed of atoms. And atoms exist in two states. One stable state where there's an equal number of electrons and protons in the atom. The electrons, as we believe, are circulating around the uh, surface, the shell of the atom, and the protons are at the, uh, in the nucleus. And there's an equal amount. But, but so that's a stable, situation. And that's what we see around us. Our world is made up of stable atoms for the most part. Water is the most unstable atom. That's why it behaves in rather unique ways. Uh, it flows and does other things at certain temperatures that other materials don't. Uh, but the walls, the roof, the ceiling, our chairs we're sitting on, this blackboard, everything is comprised of stable atoms for the most part. Mm -hmm. And we understand that to be, they're, they're either a gas, a liquid, or a solid. <coughs> but outside the Earth, in, in, in all of space, this condition does not exist. Most, most of the matter in space or the atoms of space are in a, what is called an ionized state. I still have something to do. Oh, okay. Are in an ionized state. And this ionized state means that the nucleus has a net not positive charge and the electron, uh, no, that's not a good example here, the electron, has a net negative charge. And these are dissociated in space. 
and that creates a plasma. And the inherent negative and positive atoms like this, clouds of them, become superconductors. And they will conduct tremendous amounts of electrical energy from one place to another. Astronomers say no electrical fields are frozen in because plasmas are such good conductors it instantaneously um, neutralizes the charge. It, the, the charge moves and it does it in a flash and then everything is stable again. In fact, Birkeland and others have demonstrated, uh, I won't go through all of it, that uh, Electricity in space is the thing that moves everything about. It's what lights the stars. It's what organizes planets and stars. All of this has been demonstrated experimentally. It's just that science is unwilling to look at that because the geology of science comes from the gaslight era before the days of electricity. I think one thing that um, you can go do or, or go to YouTube and watch that shows the power of electricity and even just holding things together or is a water bridge. Yeah, the water bridge is very interesting. I recommend everyone look for that. Where you can get these two little cups and you put electricity through it and the water jumps the cups where without the electricity flowing to, it, it won't jump the cup. And it's a bridge, it's stable it continually moves and so I think that just shows that electricity has a lot more effect of holding things together than right. we give credit. And and electricity electricity creates when it moves and that's the only way we can identify it. It creates uh, electrical fields or this blackboard isn't going to let me do this. Creates electrical fields, tremendously powerful electrical fields. And any physicist will tell you that what I'm about to say is correct. Gravity is a weak force. It's the one that they recur to in all scientific descriptions. But the force of gravity is swamped by the electromagnetic force. That is, if we can acknowledge that it is electricity that governs the orbits of planets and the structure of um, galaxies and, and sculpts the face of planets, uh, then we can begin to see how powerful electricity is. It acts in much the same way that air and water do in the erosion process. Um, ionized particles rushing to uh, uh, equalize an electric charge between, say, two planets can cause tremendous distortion on the surface of the planet. You get mountain building, you get crater building, which are not impact craters at all, most of them. Uh, you get uh, uh, water moving, you get all kinds of tectonic activity, things that we just typically don't associate with electricity. But in fact, as I look at the Exodus event now, for example, I realize that all of the plagues of the Exodus were due to electromagnetic effects. From, from the burning bush of Moses, to the water turning to blood, to the darkness, to the earthquakes, all of it are their secondary phenomena associated with electromagnetic things. Gravity in, in, in a situation like the Earth is in now, has tremendous uh, effect because there's no or very little electromagnetic effect. But when two planets come close together, that is enhanced. Well, we'll talk more about that in another lecture probably. But I want to emphasize that we don't understand electricity nearly as well as we think we do. We've harnessed it. Uh, just like we can figure out how to build a fire, but we don't know what fire is. Um, on an elemental basis, we can describe it chemically. We can describe what's going on, 
but we don't understand how it works. The same is true with electricity. We use it to, like I said, light our homes. Let me use this example here, Stephen. If I get close, you see this little fluorescent light? There's no contact. This is not plugged into any wall. And yet the energy from that plasma ball lights the fluorescent lights in the tube. Why does it do that? Because it causes a, a flow of electricity towards the bulb and it causes the inert gases in the fluorescent tube to fluoresce, to glow. And in, in antiquity, the same thing happened in space. It happens every day now. Okay, you can turn the light on. It happens every day right now. We call it the aurora borealis. And, and astronomers describe it as a collision of particles that causes the light. Again, they're very big on collisions and explosions because they don't want to see electricity as a source. Again, why? Because Newton's theories uh, on which astronomy is presently based uh, were written in the gaslight era long before electricity became uh, commonplace as it is today. And uh, a, a lot of people, like Tesla, the man who invented these fluorescent lights that we see, that invented this little gadget called the Tesla coil, uh, the man who literally single-handedly built the electric multi-phase motor, polyphase motor that we use in all of our electrical devices today, said that electricity is the stuff that governs the universe. And that astronomers, uh, the, the uh, science of astronomy has been hijacked by mathematicians describing things mathematically without considering the real physical world so we get things like black holes and dark matter. Because of why? Because our formulas say that it, there has to be something like that because our formulas are based in a gravity only universe. Yes? Well, it's interesting about their equations. Sometimes they put things in just to make it work. Yeah. And they, they don't know why. It just it makes the equation work so it must be true rather than maybe the models or the theory is wrong yeah. and trying to really go look at what's going on. Thanks, Stephen. So, we come back to electricity. There are many forms of electricity. We know about the stuff that moves through wires because we use it to light our homes and heat our homes and all the rest. It's carried to our homes in wire. Actually, you just saw a demonstration where electrical energy can be transmitted through the air. I could transmit it, I'd hold that in my hand and, and hold the light up here and it would glow. It would go through my body. Actually, it's traveling across the surface of the body. Um, uh, Tesla said, there's no reason to have wires. That's what he <clears throat> originally patented, but he came back and said, no, we can transmit energy from a tower, a dozen towers around the world, fill the air with energy, and all you have to do is have a receiver on the other end to use it. You could use it in an airplane or a car or a home or, or in your toothbrush if you want. Uh, and, and you wouldn't have to have wires. The same idea would broadcast energy that would do work. So this is the, this is the energy that we know about. Think of electricity as doing work. Think of a bicycle chain where, where the chain wraps around the sprockets at both ends. One end, there's the pedals, and the other end is the, is the wheel where it contacts the street and allows you to move. And, and the way we move a bicycle down is to <coughs> continuously rotate that <coughs> chain around the sprockets to make that rear wheel turn, okay? In electrical terms, this, this is the chain becomes the wire in which the current moves, and it is the equivalent of a direct current, or DC. 
But the thing that made Tesla interesting is he came along and he said, instead of making that electricity go all the way from the source back to the place where the work is being done and then back to the source, making that whole trip, he said, what if we just move electricity back and forth? We change the phase of the electricity so it shifts back and forth. So the electrons don't have to make the whole journey, they just move a little ways this way and then they move back the same distance, alternating every 60 times every second, hence a 60 second cycle alternating current, okay? Alternating current. And it's much more efficient because you only have to move those electrons a fraction of an inch each way. And you still get work done at the other end. All you have to do is design a motor that will respond to that alternating current, which is what Tesla did. Now the reason I tell you that is because there are so many manifestations, types of energy, electricity, that we don't understand. In space, I referenced plasmas before. In space, matter 99.9%, .9 virtually all matter, for all intents and purposes, is in a plasma state or an ionized state, which means that electricity can move freely and easily anywhere in the universe. And it does. The idea is that all of the stars we see in the sky at night, suns in our galaxy, are strung along these dark currents of plasma that we cannot see, just like the wires in the wall of the house. We, we, they don't illuminate, the lights do, but the wires don't. Yet the wires carry the same current that we see manifest in the light that's created. And the same thing happens with the sun. Sun is not a thermonuclear engine. It is an electromagnetic engine. All stars are electromagnetic engines. The very structure of a galaxy is that was demonstrated by, uh, I'm not going to be able to say his name, um, uh, one of the early pioneers in electricity, created what's called a homopolar motor, and it spins due to electrical charge. It's a very simple motor. Um, and the structure is the same as we see in a galaxy again, Stephen. Well, I was going to say, uh, you know, a lot of scientists and a lot of people think the sun is thermodynamic, but a lot of the um, energy sources they've tried to make off of those theories that they think is going on the sun always fails. Yeah, uh, and science just turns a blind eye to the to the uh, effects they see going on on the sun that have no explanation. They scratch their head and say, "Well, we don't know, but we'll discover it one day." Because, but we know that it's a thermonuclear engine. Why? The simplest answer is because we discovered how to create thermonuclear energy before before the atom bomb. Pete scientists thought that, that there was some kind of a chemical reaction creating the heat from the sun. An ancient man called it the fire of the sun. The sun was burning like a log. We really haven't progressed much beyond that point. But let me talk about this plasma. In space, there are all of these ion clouds of ionized particles. And if electrical charge wants to get from one place to another, here, here the charge is negative and here it's, well, it's, we'll call it positive. In reality, it's just less or more negative than this part over here. That's just the way it works. And don't ask me, I'm not, a, I'm not an electrical engineer, okay? And so I'm just gonna try to describe this as best I can. These ionized particles create a very efficient uh, path for the electricity to follow. It's called a superconductor. Superconductor. That's why scientists say, astronomers say, well, electrical fields are frozen in in space. They, they don't move. There's no real current moving uh, because 
the uh, ionized particles are such good conductors that if there's any uh, disequilibrium, dis any imbalance, uh, it's quickly neutralized by a change transfer of current. But what we see going on in the sun belies that. The sun constantly puts out electrical energy or heat and light because it's constantly receiving electrical energy through this very medium right here. And they call them Birkeland currents because they're spinning like this. And they come in pairs. Even if you could see the little filaments in this plasma ball that I demonstrated earlier, if you could look close enough, you'd see they're in pairs. And they're constantly splitting and recombining. Why do I tell you all this? Well, it wasn't meant to be a lecture in physics. It's because Joseph Smith had some things to say about this that are rather fascinating in light of this information. Now let me go back to the, to the concept of the polar configuration which Joseph Smith drew. Yes, he drew a picture of what the heavens used to look like over the earth. I'll try to uh, mimic that here quickly. He drew it for Philo Dibble. Philo Dibble is the man who was responsible for recording much of the information uh, uh, surrounding revelations. He was there, he was a bodyguard for Joseph Smith, and LDS historians have relied on any number of people, Philo Dibble among them. He's considered a valid source. But when he produced this picture, it was so misunderstood by Latter-day Saints that it's been kicked to the curb and very few even pay attention to it. But here's, and, and he had his own interpretation of this. I won't go into that in this case. He had his own interpretation and that was one that we'll discuss another time. But what the picture that Joseph Smith drew says, that these planets were in a line. He drew a dotted line up through here. I'm not very good at it. Indicating a common axis of rotation. Just had to consult my spell checker. That says rotation. <laughs> Why was that important? Because it was electrical energy coursing through this line of planets. And the Earth, of course, is down here, and Joseph didn't draw the Earth in this picture, contrary to Philo Dibble's interpretation. Through the Earth, and there were probably other planets lined up, and that's, again, another discussion. The point is that electrical energy was moving through here that created electromagnetic fields that held all this together. It's called, it's called quantum trapping. You can see that, again, on the internet, as Stephen says. Uh, you can see a demonstration of that. It's called magnetic, another term is magnetic levitation. They take a silicon wafer and they super, they super cool it and then they poise it over a magnet and it just hovers there. It's also called a superconductor. Superconductor. And, and what, they, what they will tell you is that it's levitating over it. What only a few show, but they do show it, is if you take that magnet and you turn it over like that, the superconductor, the wafer, remains locked in position. What does that mean in space? That means two bodies with, with differing charges can, can be locked in an electromagnetic embrace as they move through space together in tandem. The very thing that Joseph Smith drew here for Philo Dibble. Okay? Why is this important? 
Well, if this existed in the heavens, if this was the old heaven and the old earth that the prophets talk, they talk about a new heaven and a new earth because the old heaven and the old earth passed away. If this was the way things existed, it meant our ancestors lived in an enhanced electromagnetic environment, this very environment here that I drew with the planets in. What did that cause? What, did, what was life like in a world like that? Human beings, all we have to do is consult the scriptural record and the accounts of cultures not Judeo-Christian. And what do we find? They say the most, the first thing they talk about is longevity. Adam, Enoch, Methuselah, uh, any number of the early prophets, early patriarchs, are said to have lived hundreds of years. Now we're getting to the immortality part, just, just so you know where we are in the story. <laughs> Genesis chapter 11, I think. I can find it here. This, this is one of those little things that when you study the Old Testament, you go, boring. And Peleg lived 30 years and beget Reu, and Peleg lived after he beget Reu 209 years and beget sons and daughters. And Reu lived two and 30 years and beget Serug, and Serug lived after he beget Serug uh, 207 years and beget son and daughters. And Serug lived 30 years and beget Nahor, and Serug lived after he beget. Why? Why this genealogy? Joseph Smith did a whole sermon on this. Did you know that? Why was the prophet fascinated because we're supposed to do genealogy? No, that's not why he said it. Well, here's the clue. The very earliest lifespan is uh, Shem. Well, let's see. Well, for the sake of time, because I'm not a scriptorian. I get lost when I get into the scriptures. I'll freely admit it. <laughs> we find out, we, we find out that Adam, for example, lived 700 some odd years, as did Enoch. And, and, and uh, Methuselah, lived over 800 years, almost 900 years. I thought Adam was 900 years. Yeah. I thought Adam was like 950. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. He wasn't the oldest, he was, but he was like... He was up there. Thank you. Point, point being, human being, and unless this is some kind of a transcription error, and I doubt that it is, I know there have been a lot of scholars make a lot of excuses. They say, well, these are all... You took, you'd reduce them by a factor of 10, and then it becomes understandable, you see. Um, no, because here's what happens. That ignores the rest of the record. The rest of the record, we get down through all of these uh, who begat whom accounts here, 11. Let's see if I can Was find Was Noah this. around 250? Oh, no, I don't recall what Noah was. It's, he's he's uh, 400 some odd years. Okay. Well, here's, here's uh, verse 32 in chapter 11 of Genesis. In the days of Terah, who was whose father? Abraham's father. Thank you. 205 years. Now, why? That, that, makes, that makes the flood... The flood event, Noah's event, a watershed event, forgive the pun. Let's see. Do this right. Before the flood, people lived hundreds of years. After the flood, it went down to about 100 years. Abraham, I think, is 120 years, something like that. 
and, and beyond that lifespan. Eventually, we know, got down to like 30 to 40 years. Why? <laughs> I'll suggest an answer, okay? The flood, the flood is the event that saw the demise of this polar configuration that Joseph Smith drew. And the polar configuration maintained an environment on the earth that allowed human beings to live longer and healthier lives. It wasn't just what you ate. It was the electromagnetic environment that caused the the processes in your body that give you energy and strength, the regenerative processes of your body to be greatly enhanced <clears throat> over what we see now. Yes. The, all the plants and the animals were two and three times the size they are today too. Yeah, we, we know that from the uh, geological record. Um, yeah, I won't go into that, it's too much detail, yes. To go along with that, pH is a measure of energy Bodies. Yeah. Um, well, there are ma there are many measures. pH is just one of them. Sure. And, and, and to and to heal, oh, go ahead. And to heal, you need so much pH or energy, and without that, you'll you'll just stay sick or or cut. You actually need energy in your body to heal, which is what Anthony's talking about. Mitochondria in the body, every cell has mitochondria. Every bi biologist in the world will say yes. It is in the mitochondria where the energy is manufactured. We don't kind of know what exactly, well we sort of know, but we really don't. Mitochondria manufacture the energy that the cell needs to function. And the mitochondria is responsive to electromagnetic fields. And it operates more efficiently or less efficiently based upon the electromagnetic field that it's in. Our Earth today is in a nearly sterile electromagnetic environment. That's why we don't have electromagnetic events happening around it. Gravity dominates in our solar system. The electromagnetic events happened eons ago before the flood and for a period of time after the flood. This is the watershed event. This is, what, this is why the prophet Joseph Smith dedicated a whole lecture to these genealogies and specifically noted the ages of these people changed. Because he was trying to describe, and he never got around to saying, but I'm convinced this is what he was saying, that the flood, before the flood, we had the old heavens that Peter references and that uh, the Lord himself references in Doctrine and Covenants, Revelations to Joseph Smith. And they were replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. And the, the old heaven and the, excuse me, the old heavens, not the new one, sorry, the old heavens were the ones that Joseph Smith illustrated with the planets in line. They were held there by quantum trapping because it was an electromagnetic effect. We can see it demonstrated today in these examples. So that's what changed to alter the life expectancy. The food didn't become, well, it did become more scarce in that catastrophe, but afterwards when things began to grow again, they didn't have the nutritive value. Why? Because they weren't operating in the same system that we were operating in. Okay, now let's get to the crux of all of this. What happened, what happened after the first vision? What was the next vision that Joseph Smith had? after the first vision. What was the next primary vision that Joseph Smith had? Visitation from Moroni? Let's see if I, can get 
I know we've all read it, but my question to you is, have we understood it? While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room. In light of what we are discussing here, how is light created? Electricity. Electricity. So what does that mean with regard to Moroni's presence? About electricity. Pardon me? About electricity. Clearly, a resurrected being is the focus of tremendous electromagnetic energy such that the body appears to emanate light. We have some good examples of that in the scriptures, don't we? Can anyone tell me from the Old Testament a similar circumstance? How about this guy? When Moses came down off the mount after speaking with the Lord, in other words, after being in the Lord's presence, what happened? His face shone. His face shone, and the Israelites were so afraid, they didn't dare come near him. Where else did it happen, folks? Abinadi. Abinadi? That's a good example, not the one I was looking for. Yeah, but... <laughs> Remember when he took the apostles up on the mountain and set them aside and then went further to the top? And all of a sudden, who appeared? Moses, this guy. And what did the apostles report? Christ shone, his face shone. Exactly the same thing that had happened with Moses. Exactly the same thing that Joseph Smith reported with Moroni. What are these scriptural accounts telling us about resurrected beings, folks? They're lit up. They're lit up. Big time. They are the focus of electrical energy. Now, There's a very interesting thing. My son uh, works for Intel, and he makes those little wa the big wafers with all the little chips that are then subsequently put into computers and telephones and all kinds of other things. And my son tells me that there's this, that, that an LED, a light, and it's not just my son, but I like to trot him out because he's brilliant. Naturally. <laughs> Not because he's my son, okay? Just because he's a bright guy. LEDs, light emitting diodes. They're made of silicon. What's that? Crystal. Sand. Rock. Stone. What makes a seer stone work? What makes a urim thummim work? What lit the barges of the of the uh, Jaredites? What lit the stones that the brother of Jared had the finger of the Lord touch and it illuminated them? When Christ was ministering in Jerusalem, the woman touched his skirt, his gown, and he said, "Something has gone out of me." said virtue, but virtue was Virtues looking up in the dictionary. In the Greek. Yeah. The interesting thing about these diodes, these LEDs, 
is they, they have what's called a PN junction in them. And I'm not even going to try to explain it. But it is crucial to the operation of any diode, any um, uh, transistor. It's a, it's a miniature transistor. And you know what? Human bone, any kind of bone, consists of a large part of this PN junction. So if Moroni or, or, or Joseph Smith, we'll put him down here because I meant to mention that there are many anecdotal accounts, but good accounts nevertheless, of people who saw him with his face glowing. What was this, what was that uh, anti-Mormon woman's name that claimed that he was, uh, uh, what's the word? Oh, words won't come to me sometime. False prophet, fraud. That Joseph Smith was uh, sickly. What's the word? Pale. Um, and maybe the word will come to me. Uh, she said, well, that's why his face appeared to glow, because he was just, okay. pardon me? Ron Brody. Yeah, Fawn Brody was one of them. And there's another one. But uh, anyway, um, if, if this PN junction business that these, um, people that make silicon wafers and LEDs are talking about is in our bone. If, um, if one of us were in the presence of an immortal being that had a tremendous amount of electrical energy, that electrical energy would be transmitted to us just as that energy was when I did this little all here. And for a time, until that electrical energy would dissipate it, that electrical charge would cause our bones to glow. How many of you have taken a flashlight in the, in the night and put your hands there and you can see the yeah. light from the flashlight going through your skin? It doesn't go through where the bone is, but it does where the skin is. What if your bones were glowing? What would happen? Okay. Joseph Smith commented with Moroni, it wasn't an intense light, but it was bright as the noonday sun. It was a gentle light. It wasn't the electrical energy that lights these lights. You touch those and you need to see the scientific explanation behind it if we care to look. Joseph, it, it, the reason the face glows is because that's where the skin is the thinnest over the bone in our bodies. You know, there's a lot of muscles around our arms and our legs and our torso but bone is just barely under the skin, in the face and the head. So what glows? Moses' face when he's in the presence of the Lord. Jesus' face when he was in the presence of Moses and Elias. And Joseph Smith when he was in the presence of Moroni or whoever else he was in the presence of. What does this tell you about Joseph Smith? Of He's authentic. He is authentic. He is what he said he was. You know, the critics say, well, he made this stuff up. It's stupid. And yet, in light of this evidence, there's nothing stupid about it. It's revelatory. It's revolutionary. That's why I get excited about cosmology and, and catastrophism in the electric universe because it sheds so much light on the restoration and it allows us to see Joseph Smith as the prophet. And this is the message of the lesson. If in the resurrection, we become immortal. We do so because the efficiency of our body is ratcheted up to the point that it becomes immortal. Our bodies repair themselves. Antibiotics, for example, just kick 
the immune system into high gear, and the body is the thing that gets rid of the disease. All chemical reactions at heart are electrical. If you've ever studied chemistry, you know about valences, and valences are all about charge, the sharing of atoms. We look at this stuff like this, and physicists say, you know, there's more empty space there than there is matter. So why does it feel solid to us? Electrical charge, valence, the electromagnetic, what you're encountering here isn't hard matter, it's matter entangled in tremendous amounts of energy. Lattices that are formed in bonds that are so strong that it takes a tremendous amount of force to move them or change them. You see? So if you want to if you want to consider immortality, what you want to realize is that becoming immortal means your body becomes the focus of an incredible amount of electromagnetic energy such that your body emits light. Your bones glow all the time. Waves and particles. Pardon me? Waves and particles. Waves and particles, yeah. Well, it's energy, and I'm not even going to get into the argument of whether it's photons or electrons, whether it's a wave or a particle. Uh, that discussion... Oh, it's both. I would have to think it was a particle if you could recognize a person, but you've got I, I, I don't, way just I, I don't know, okay? That's a simple answer. I don't know. Except saying. that I know that the argument is sometimes created by a distort, series of distorted premises on which the experiments are based. Uh, and, and just as an example, my point then is that Joseph Smith showed us what immortality means and we don't even understand it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Pardon me. I forget the camera. That's okay. Just wants to show up we, I get excited about this stuff, people, because, because there is so much more to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, and the revelations of Joseph Smith than Latter-day Saints are even aware of. We do not study the prophet. Well, there's some parts of what he taught we study incessantly, which is fine. But there are other parts that we ignore to our own detriment. Anyway, let me just let me just point out one little experiment with light here that just destroys everything that we know or we think we know about uh, light and the, and the physics behind light. They did an experiment and it's been reproduced several times. They did only experiment where there was an emitter. An emitter, we'll just make a little box here. And there was a receiver. We'll make it another little box. And the light, the emitter, puts out a pulse of light, a photon, if you will. And the target is the receiver. Boom. And of course, we're monitoring all this electronically from some kind of a magic computer box here. Okay? And, and uh, so we, we shoot a photon out, bang, hits the receiver, and the receiver says to us, yes, I saw that photon. I saw this light go on and off. Millisecond, less than a milli, far less than a millisecond. This emitter is on and then it's off. So, we measure this and we come up with a fixed number, okay? Some number 
We say, well, the speed of light then is this. But they weren't satisfied with that. They were trying to understand this wave particle business. So they put in between here a little gadget that they called, what did they call it? This is a shield. No, it was a, uh, it, it's like those things there on the wall that you open and close. Um, a shutter. That's what they called it. A shutter. And the shutter again was connected here so that it all was monitored and it was carefully functioning. And here's the, here's the idea. Based on this calculation of the speed of light, they could predict when that photon would arrive at the shutter and open it at the precise moment that the photon arrived there so that it could move through the shutter and then close the shutter behind it so the receiver would then see the photon. Boom. Yep. Saw the photon. Worked exactly the way they theorized it would. But they said, well, at that speed, if we close the shutter uh, a little bit before the photon, then what will happen? Well, the receiver won't see the photon. Well, what about if we, what about if we close the shutter when the photon is halfway here in this process, or halfway here, what would we see? Well, if we close the shutter and it's halfway here, based on our calculation of the speed of light, we won't, the receiver won't see it. But guess what? The receiver did see it. And, and they, they repeated the experiment and they opened the shutter at, at the very instant that the emitter fired this photon and then immediately closed it, which should have precluded any reception of the photon at the other end. But it didn't. The receiver, and this experiment's been repeated. Do you see this in the public media described? No, because it's counterintuitive to everything that we're taught about the fixed speed of light. Turns out, if you read a man called Walt, Walter Walt Thornhill and his information is at uh, thunderbolts.info, don't write .com, you'll go the wrong place, thunderbolts.info. You can read what Walt Thornhill says about these things. Light is not what we've been taught it is. The speed of light is really a measurement of uh, probably the instrumentation that we're using to try to measure it. While Thornhill maintains that light, the speed of light is nearly instantaneous at any distance, any distance. It means that the light coming from Alpha Centauri doesn't take thousands or tens of thousands of years to get here from one side of the galaxy to the other or from another galaxy to our galaxy. It means it happens right now. It means we live in a real time universe. guessing that you've uh, determined that uh, the speed of light and radio waves are, are completely different. Um, yeah, they well, are. Just uh, a different frequency. Yeah, so the, the frequencies if are, change. If they are 186,000 miles per second, which my light goes, yeah. would indicate that, uh, that um, <coughs> radio waves should be received by a satellite <coughs> instantaneously, which is not. It's not the case. And they can measure that. And it does 186,000 miles per the, the, the thing that, the thing that, the reason I mentioned this, okay, is because it comes into play in the revelations of Joseph Smith 
and these angels and the light and all the rest, these resurrected beings. Of course, that may be a different type. Of, uh, it 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 means. Yeah, it it well, it, it's electrical. It could, it That's could the be, only thing we know of that it emits could light. That it could be the priesthood as a as a higher power than electronics and electricity. So okay, I'm not sure if that's a different energy at all. But you may be. I don't know if you argue with that. Yeah. Except that some things like radio waves, we know how fast they go. Yeah. And we know that every. And we know how fast. Um, microwaves are the same. Microwaves all. all all various types of energy, all generated, by the way, by elect, most easily by electricity, you see. Just the spectrum of light is, is, is you know, all light that there is. The, the, reason, the reason that light, that Thornhill says that it's near instantaneous is because there is a medium involved. Space is not a vacuum, as we've been taught. We know it's full of what? Plasma. Neutrinos. A very mysterious byproduct of any energy source that we have yet to understand. But, and they're traveling at tremendous rates of speed, but they can also transmit this. Um, Wall Thornhill's not a Latter-day Saint, but he posits that, that the universe itself is its own database. That the universe, that, that, that there is a record made of everything in matter. Now this would explain how a Urim and Thummim or a seer stone could access data, uh, a universal database. You see, we're not, in my view, we're not that far from understanding how the uh, works of godliness are accomplished. And Joseph Smith gave us the key to understanding those things. Now I know some people chafe at the idea that, that something they've been taught all their life is strictly metaphysical and spiritual and has no basis in the material world, uh, I know how they kind of recoil from that idea. But I'm telling you if you, can, if you can accept it, seeing the world from this perspective makes it much more understandable. And that's my message to you tonight. Something to think about. Questions? I'll try to answer your questions as we go over. I guess